Are you all ready? Settle yourself. You know, in Bangkok, if we're running an event and it's raining, only half the people turn up. And it's like, you know, there's a lot of people in Bangkok who want to gain the absolute, ultimate, perfect liberation of the heart. But not if it's raining. <laughs> we want to get enlightened on a sunny day, you know. <laughs> so, I do appreciate you all uh, coming out tonight, uh, today, braving the rain and uh, traveling um, out to join in this meditation and uh, Dharma session. I thought I'd start with a s little recount of uh, my time my, when I was in India before I became a monk, just before. I was on my way to Thailand to ordain. And I was in India for a, a while, and I went to visit the Sri Ramana Maharshi ashram. Now, just a quick show of hands, how many people know Ramana Maharshi? You know who he was? Zip! Nothing! <laughs> Crickets! No one knows Ramana Maharshi. Right, next time I come, we're going to do a session on Ramana Maharshi. Can we do a video? Can we do a video, s show the film on the... Okay. So next time I come, I'll introduce to you to Ramana Maharshi. He was an uh, Indian sage, saint, guru, enlightened master. Uh, he died in around 1950. And he was very, very influential, which is interesting because he said very little. His main teaching was silence. People would come to him and ask questions, he'd just... <laughs> it's pretty good actually, I like that. I'm going to try that myself. Just, But people would start having these revelations and these deep meditations just by being around him. It's said that he used to ooze silence. He used to just, whenever you come into his presence, your mind, into his presence, your mind would go very quiet. Now, obviously, I never met him. He died before I was born. But I have met a Burmese monk who was like that. And he came to do a talk for us in Bangkok. And someone said to me, oh, this monk, he's so good. You've got to get him to do a talk. So I invited him. We set it up. And I got accommodation for him. I invited everybody to come to the talk. And then I went to see him like an hour before the talk. And I said, oh, hello, Venerable. So nice of you to come. We'd like to welcome you to Bangkok. And he went, no English. <laughs> so we're having a talk with somebody who speaks zero English. Very interesting. But because he can't speak English and there's nothing I could do, I couldn't cancel now. So I just sat there feeling a little forlorn. I was like, what can I do? And my mind just went really quiet. And then I just sat with him in the room for an hour before the talk and I was just I was just so happy. And the interesting thing was during the talk, which was in pseudo English, but he was reading from a really wacky Burmese text that made no sense and his accent was very hard. And so about half the people in the audience who had come, there's about thirty or forty people came, uh, half the people complained to me afterwards you inviting us out for this monk, he doesn't speak any English, we've traveled all across Bangkok and blah 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 and you know, blame me a little bit for it. Said, you know, make sure you tell us next time if they can speak English. And the other half of the audience, all the people who have had some experience with meditation, also couldn't understand the word he was talking about, but just went into the most beautiful meditation and I got all these emails like, we've got to get this guy back, I had the most wonderful meditation. I don't know what he said, but I had the most wonderful meditation. <laughs> and it was interesting that it's all those people who've done their meditation, who'd paid their dues, who were able to feel and feed off that silence of this Bur Burmese monk. And really, when you, you sit with him, like everybody I know who did meditation, they all kind of felt this silence that come off him. And it made your mind go very quiet. 
So Ramana Maharshi was one of these. Now, was he Buddhist? Was he not? Can a non-Buddhist attain enlightenment? These are all interesting questions. Was he a Buddhist? Was he Hindu? Was he nothing? Was he his own thing? Was he Advaita? I mean, it, it's very hard to say. He himself, when he was 14, he was lying down in a boat and he thought, what would happen if I died? And then he went into this very deep meditation and started to get all these experiences of emptiness. And from that point on, uh, he would just go into more and more meditation spontaneously. And you see photos of him, his legs are all covered in scars because when he was around 18, he had this vision that he had to go and live by a mountain called Arunachala. And he went to this mountain and just as he got there, he went into the basement of a temple and sat there for months and months and all the local children would come and throw rotten food at him and stones and things like this. And he would just sit there in the basement of this cellar and the rats would chew on his legs. So he had all these marks on his legs. But he was just in bliss. He was in total bliss and happiness. And then bit by bit, eventually they pulled him out of the cellar and put him in another place. And then bit by bit, people would start to come to him. He didn't say anything. He never spoke for, you know, 20 odd years. But he would gain more and more disciples. And then he started to speak and he just had a very simple teaching. His teaching roughly was, um, ask yourself, who am I? Follow the sense of who am I back to the source and then you, you will realize there is no one there and then you will know the true self. That was basically his uh, teaching. So, there's some interesting questions actually, if, since you don't know Ramana Maharshi, I can show you the little video, we can talk about him and ask whether he's enlightened or not enlightened. Can a person who isn't teaching the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, can they be enlightened? These are interesting questions. One of the customs and traditions of the Ramana Maharshi Ashram now, which is, he spent his whole life in this one mountain that he'd seen in his vision called Arunachala and it's a source of pilgrimage you know thousands and thousands of people go every year uh, it's quite a spiritual hot spot there's quite a number of kind of groups have places around the mountain and one of the traditions is if you walk right around the mountain you are guaranteed to become enlightened <laughs> yeah. so of course I did it. I walked around the mountain. But the funny thing was, I was with them. Um, I'd traveled there with a really horrible American guy. He's, he was terrible to be around. And he was really into his, like, guru persona. And he never wore shoes in India. And I don't need shoes. You know, this is how you people did it in the past. And, you know, the reason people didn't wear shoes in the past was because you know, they're expensive and they were hard to find and it, it was a, you know, it showed that you were wealthy. It was, a, it was luxurious to wear shoes. Yeah. Nowadays, you know, $3 for a pair of plastic flip-flops. It's not luxurious anymore. So, I always, in Thailand, I always say, why do the monks go bindabat, go on arms round, barefoot? What, what's the point of that? The peop they went barefoot in the past to show that they weren't living a luxurious lifestyle. But a three dollar pair of flip-flops is hardly a luxurious lifestyle, right? So I, I think the monks should wear shoes, um, but nobody listens to my viewpoint. Um, <laughs> so I don't get very far with that particular campaign. So, uh, this guy who was walking around with no shoes, he just had two t-shirts, they were both filthy, he grew his hair long, he never washed it, and he was, you know, really kind of an egotistical spiritual warrior, you know. It's, uh, and when we got there, we walked up the mountain to see the place where Ramana Maharshi used to live and meditate. And he said to me, you can't wear shoes. He said, this is a sacred mountain, you can't wear shoes on this mountain. Have to walk barefoot. Is that if you wear shoes, all the locals will look down on you and they'll consider you being sacrilegious to the mountain and 
And he went on and on and on. I was like, oh, God, okay. And I threw my shoes away. I'm like, let's go. So we walked up this mountain. Well, he walked up this mountain. I went all the way up this mountain. And we must have seen about, I don't know, 150 people on the way up and on the way down. Not a single one was barefoot. <laughs> so the next morning we're going to walk around the mountain, but because it's about, it takes around six or seven hours, and so you've got to get up early. The, the way to do it is to leave at three or four o'clock in the morning, so it's still cool when you uh, are getting around the mountain. And he didn't want to get up at three o'clock in the morning. Apparently gurus don't wear shoes, but they also don't get up at three o'clock in the morning. And so we left him behind, and me and a bunch of people, we walked around the mountain, and now I'm guaranteed to become an arahant. So. What they don't tell you is how long it's going to take you after you've walked around the mountain. Right? You're guaranteed enlightenment, but they don't say when you're going to get enlightened. We have the same concept in Buddhism, the, in Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, they say, if you have seen even one word of the Lotus Sutra, you're guaranteed to become enlightened. Perfect. Not enlightenment. It, but to become a Buddha, yeah, even better. They always go one better, right, in Mahayana. So you'd guarantee to become a Buddha, even if you've seen only one word. So some Tibetans that I know, they, Tibetan Buddhists, they wear little corners of scriptures in a little case, almost like an amulet, and they wear them on the outside of the shirt. So when they're walking around and interacting with people, people will see you know, a couple of words of the Lotus Sutra, and then they're all guaranteed to become fully enlightened Buddhas, having seen this. The question is then, how long does it take to become enlightened? You know, once we're guaranteed, once we're on the path, a Sodapanna, stream enterer, is supposed to be able to get fully enlightened within seven lifetimes. Uh, it doesn't mean it will take seven lifetimes, it may take an hour, it may take ten minutes, but within seven lifetimes you're guaranteed to become fully enlightened. <coughs> then we have to find out what a soda panna is. Now there's quite a lot of arguments about that, about the meaning of the word and the definition for a soda panna, and a stream mantra. Uh, how long does it take you? So I walked around this mountain, I'm guaranteed enlightenment, but I don't know when. So this is what I call long listed for enlightenment. <laughs> Right? <laughs> I'm not on the short list, I'm not expecting immediate results, you know. I, I need the compound interest to build up a little bit before I can, you know, draw on my spiritual bank. How do you make deposits into your spiritual bank account? How do you uh, uh, develop the right qualities? How do you progress towards enlightenment? Is enlightenment something that happens suddenly? Or is it something that happens gradually? This is a very interesting question. And there are a lot of different answers to this. So I have my answer, and because I have the microphone, that's the answer that we're going to have today. But I do accept and, uh, and welcome other ideas. Um, there are different thoughts, and there's lots, very deep, very good topic of conversation. Uh, first, just double-checking what is enlightenment. Enlightenment is the unconditioned. Unconditioned. This means it's there. Buddha said there is the unconditioned, otherwise there would be no holy life. So the unconditioned is there, asankata dhamma. The dhamma without sankara, unconditioned, unformed. It doesn't arise, it doesn't change, it doesn't pass away. It's not near or far, coarse or refined. Uh, in fact, it's the jitta without an object, jitta anaramana, a jitta, the mind without an object. Uh, this is the unconditioned. So that means we can't possibly attain to the unconditioned. It's impossible. You can't do something that will make the unconditioned come up. Right? Because it's unconditioned. It doesn't arise. Anything that arises is going to cease. 
Therefore, the unconditioned must always be there. And this is where the idea of um, Buddha nature comes from in Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, we don't specifically state Mah uh, Buddha nature in Theravada Buddhism, but it is there in this concept of unconditioned. Buddha nature is something that's the same for everybody, doesn't arise, doesn't cease, doesn't pass away. This is the quality of the unconditioned. So that means there's nothing you, you can do to attain it, right? Nothing you can do to attain to the unconditioned, because anything you do, that's just something arising. I think I said last week, there's this concept that, well, enlightenment, because you can't do it, make it happen, then enlightenment is like an accident, but meditation is being more accident prone. So meditation will give you that kind of direction, will lean you in towards enlightenment, but ultimately you can't do it. You can't do it by obeying rules, you can't do it by keeping precepts, you can't do it by concentrating on certain objects, can't do it by controlling your mind, nothing you can do. I think this is why Ramana Maharshi was just answer with silence, right? Anything that you say, well I can say do this or do that, but that's not going to be enlightenment either, is it? This is why in Buddhism we say there are many Pacheka Buddhas. Pacheka Buddhas are those who have come across enlightenment without hearing the Four Noble Truths or the Eightfold Path, without a teaching, but they've stumbled upon and become enlightened. But then they have no way to pass that teaching on to others. So it's the quality of a Pacheka Buddha. It doesn't mean they can't teach anybody anything, but if you haven't come to something through a system, systemized thinking, you can't teach it to anyone else. You might compare to, you might compare to uh, Daniel Tannett, do you know him? Anyone heard of Daniel Tannett? Boy, can we do another day on Daniel Tannett? <laughs> He's one of the world's great savants. Uh, look him up on YouTube and I think his, I think the YouTube is called The Boy with the Incredible Brain. I'm pretty sure that's the YouTube. And he is a savant, which means he has these incredible qualities of the mind, uh, kind of like in an autistic sense, but savants are still able to function well in society. Although if you read his book, you realize he, he has a very hard time relating to ordinary people. Uh, he said he can learn any language in the world fluently in one week. What do you think? <laughs> so they challenged him and they went to find a language, the root of which has absolutely no bearing on any of the other languages he speaks. Because if you speak Spanish, it's easy to learn Italian. You can speak Italian, French is a little bit easier. Um, but if you know French, Italian and Spanish, learning Thai is still a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so they picked Icelandic. It has consonants nobody's ever heard of. It has a, has a syntax and structure that has no relation to any Latin or Sanskrit based language and hardly anybody in the world speaks it, so it's very unlikely you would ever have heard any Icelandic you know, before in the past. And they gave him six days. And after six days, he does a live interview uh, in Icelandic on Icelandic TV. Yeah. And after the interview, the interviewer said, this guy is fluent in Icelandic. Yeah. He said, there's still some words that he doesn't know but he can speak fluent Icelandic. If you read the book, actually it doesn't say in the film, but if you read the book, he was supposed to go and live there for six days and they messed up the flights. Can you imagine messing up flights? That's just missing your plane or something, that's crazy. And uh, <laughs> so what they did in the end was they sent him two newspapers and a dictionary and he actually only had two days in Iceland to learn it. How did I get onto this? Okay, he does mathematics. He can, uh, one of his feats was he uh, sat and recited pi, not recited, he worked out pi 
to, I don't know, like 25,000 digits. Uh, by working it out, just sitting there, and it took him something like eight hours, and, uh, and you, you know, it's on the film, you can see him doing this. So he can do any mathematics. You can give him any number, 425,961 divided by 322.48, and he just, he gives you the answer. And the interesting thing is, when he does a number, he has a number in his, uh, every number that you tell him will have a certain shape and a certain color in his mind. And then the second number you tell him will also have a shape and a color. And then if you want to divide, multiply, add or subtract, he puts these two shapes together in his head and it comes out with a new shape and a new color. And he just knows what that number is. Okay? Now he can't tell anybody else how to do that. If you go to school and you're learning addition and subtraction and your teacher says, now just imagine a shape, you're not... <laughs> so I think this is like enlightenment. I think this is these people who have attained to enlightenment, they know what they're talking about, but how are they going to put it across to you? If they haven't had a teaching and a system that they've used to learn to attain to that thing, then they're not able to teach to other people. Right? And this was the special quality of a Buddha, a Samma Sambuddha, a perfectly enlightened Buddha. Because enlightenment is the same. There's no difference between a Buddha's enlightenment and an Arahant or a Pacheka Buddha. But a Buddha is able to systematize the teaching and say that there actually are certain things that you can do. No, that won't create enlightenment, but it will take you part of the way. It will lean you in that direction. And this is the special quality uh, of a Buddha. So an Arahant is one who has come to the teaching through, uh, sorry, come to enlightenment through hearing the teaching of a Buddha, whether that Buddha is alive or not. So you can see that this uh, unconditioned, we can't really talk about it, we can't break it down. And in fact, it's the complete opposite of breaking things down. Science breaks things down, right? First of all, we learned about physics. That um, I think it's Heraclitus was the one. And every day in, uh, in Athens, he used to plant a stick in the ground and mark where the shadow fell. Every day for years and years. Why would he do that? I'm not sure. And then he was invited, because he was a great scholar, he was invited to Alexandria. So he went down to um, Egypt. But he carried on this thing of planting the stick in the ground and measuring where the shadow falls. And he realized that the shadow falls slightly differently in Egypt on different days than it fell in Athens. And from that he worked out that the earth is 22,000 miles in circumference. <laughs> Which is pretty darn close. I think it's 26,000, right? The real, what's the circumference of the earth? You guys are not doing very well today, really, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Circumference of the earth, 26,000 miles, is it? Something like that. So science, so after learning physics, uh, we learned about uh, chemistry, about you know what makes up the world. After chemistry, we learned about biology. How does biological systems work? And then biology, when they finally got that Dutch guy, he made a very tiny little microscope out of drops of glass. And they'd have to do thousands of drops of glass to get one the right profile so that you could see. And he actually saw the human cell. So then we realized that actually the world's made up of cells. Then we break the cell and we realize the cell is made up from various aspects, including DNA. DNA is made up from molecules. Molecules are made up from elements. Elements are made up from, sorry, atoms are made up from quarks and exotic quarks and six kinds of quarks. What are the six kinds of quarks? I'm not even going to ask you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so the science breaks the world up into smaller and smaller pieces, into finer and finer detail. 
Yet the funny thing is, science is always looking for that one theory that explains everything. But how do you do it? By breaking everything up into more and more and more pieces. So religion is the opposite. The word religion, there is some debate, but one of the strong candidates for the origin of the word religion is to bind, to bring everything back together again. Yoga has the same idea, the same idea of bringing everything back, of uniting everything. And so when we're doing the practice, our practice should be something that's going in the opposite direction. We don't want to break things up into more and more parts. We want to bring everything back into a, just a simple whole. This is why I'm not a huge fan of Abhidhamma, because Abhidhamma is, will break, you know, all these endless lists of things will break the world up. It's a good tool for understanding, if your understanding can take you back to that simple experience. But it, it can be a little, you know, study, studying can be a little um, counterproductive, because it's, you start to trade your meditation experience for your knowledge experience, for your understanding. Research shows that when you understand something, you get a little flush of adrenaline, a little flush of pleasure. When you finally crack something, when you... <coughs> that's why we like to, when we're told a joke, and then you get the joke, you have that little flush of understanding. It's pleasant. And so it's a bit of a danger if you study too much, then you can, um, you know, lose that sense that actually what we should be doing is not breaking the world up into more and more pieces and theories and ideas, but we should be coming back to a very simple whole. So being long-listed for enlightenment, the question is what is the quality then that you develop to get your uh, enlightenment and the quality that I would like to suggest to you today, the best quality is patience. This is the meaning behind long listed for enlightenment, is developing this quality of patience. And what patience means is you've got less and less that you need to attain to. Now attaining to things is what the ego does. But patience doesn't need anything. If you can just be patient with everything, you need less and less. So when you do your meditation, you're not trying to manipulate things anymore. You're not trying to change things. You're not trying to change this mind into that mind, this breath into that breath, this feeling into the body, into that feeling into the body, supernormal powers, abhinya, seeing the minds of other people, seeing devas, hearing devas, and all these things are kind of attainments, things that you can get if you do it, if you want to develop the mind in that way. I know a monk, uh, I better not say who, who, <laughs> uh, he, he does, he can talk to all the devas and he can see, he has all these abhinya that you read about. And he was uh, giving a little bit of talk to a few of us and he said that he could do all this because he'd practiced concentration and he could do all this uh, psychic stuff. And he said that he would be doing his walking meditation in the forest. And he said, and all these devas would come down to see him and talk to him. And he said they would sing around him. And he'd tell him to clear off because he's doing his meditation. <laughs> And then he does this thing, he looks in your mind and then you meditate with him and then he looks in your mind and he tells you what you're doing right or wrong. Uh, and when he came round to me, I was terrified that he's going to say, boy, you've got a long way to go. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he, when he pointed to me, he just said, don't worry, it comes out by itself. And he's talking about the experience of the mind without an object the jitta without an object, and this arises as a sense of light inside the body, and you, you see the jitta, you see Lumpur Man from the forest tradition, if you read his uh, biography, I think you have that book, the biography of Lumpur Man here, uh, it's usually a free distribution, and uh, it's available on the internet, it's quite long, um, but he talks about it in there, finding the, what he called the indestructible chitta, very interesting that these concepts, is, this raises a lot of questions. Can there be something that in, indestructible that's not impermanent? So, 
a lot of good questions that we can ask around this. So he pointed at me, he said, just, it will come out by itself. And what I take from that was, he's saying, um, you're doing the right practice, just be patient with it. And then it will happen by itself when it needs, when you're ready, when you develop the right parami. I hope that's what he was saying. <laughs> Maybe he's saying, you know, wait another five lifetimes, then come back. <laughs> <laughs> so we have these two ideas. Science breaks things up, breaks things down, gets into more and more thinking, more and more things to do. Patience brings everything back home. Patience gets easier and easier, lighter and lighter. So when you do meditation, you know, when you first start, it's a real struggle just to keep your attention. It's a real struggle to keep your mind on the breath. And then every so often you hit a bit of concentration and you're like, wow, that's interesting. I remember I was con when I first started meditating, before I'd had any teachers or been to the monastery, I just read in a few books, concentrate on the breathing at the nose. I was like, right, fold the book up. And I got this wild experience after a while, that my entire body became a nose. <laughs> really, I, that was my experience. That I'd lost all sense of the body, but I had become a nose. I'm like, oh, wow. And then I, I went to the monastery, and I met, uh, he's one of the Ajahn Chah monks, and I said, yeah, 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 I got this book. He was trying to tell me about Buddhism, I'm like, yeah, 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 I got this book. And then I did this thing, and, I and it just became a nose. And he said to me, why would you want to do that? <laughs> Why would you want to become a nose? You know, no comments on my nose, please. <clears throat> so you get all of these different experiences come up when you do the concentration, when you're concentrating on an object. But the patience goes in the opposite direction, that uh, you need to do less and less. Now, if you're going to understand or come to the end of suffering, now suffering is caused by tanha, by desire, three kinds of desire. So what is the experience like without desire? Usually if we're not desiring something, we're asleep, right? It's what happened in my house on Sunday lunches, you know, when I was a kid. You have your Sunday lunches, everything's closed, we have the Sunday dinner, usually it's Usually when you're not desiring something, you just fall asleep. You're not aware, we're not accustomed to being with ourselves when we don't have desire, right? But when you do meditation, uh, if you can hold the mind still, actually desire starts to dissipate, right? You can actually use desirelessness as an object of meditation. These are the three higher forms of meditation. Emptiness, uh, signlessness, and in animita and uh, desirelessness. When you're desireless, the mind doesn't move. Any movement in the mind, that's a form of desire. So, you can't stop desire in your daily life. You're going to desire to go to the bathroom, you need to desire to clean your teeth, you need, des you know, you can't possibly be without desire in your life. It makes absolutely no sense at all. But to a meditator, it makes perfect sense, because when the mind stops still, and is without desire, without desire it doesn't need to move anywhere. When it's not moving anywhere, there's nothing left to attain to. There's nothing left to do. Then the mind, suddenly you get these flashes of the mind just having come together. Eka bhava, they call it in the suttas. Uh, it's different to uh, concentration. Eka bhava just is without an object. It just means the mind has come together and it's there, it's single, it's whole, it's still, it's bright and it's very, very happy. First of all, you get flashes of this state of when the mind has come together and usually what happens is you try to hold on to it, right? You're like, that's it, that's it, and then it's gone. So it comes up as a flash and it's only there as a flash because you've tried to reach out to it and the further the more you reach out to it, the more it's going to disappear. If you've read uh, Alice in Wonderland, you might remember that she talks about the hilltop that appears. 
And she wants to go to the hilltop, but every time she walks towards it, it gets further away. The path stretches. So she turned around and gave up, and then she found herself on the hilltop. So he's talking about meditation experiences. Once you start to see those flashes, you realize that enlightenment is not about changing all the stuff in your character. It's not about controlling your character, um, controlling your precepts, your vinaya, uh, your interaction with others. All these things are good. These are all worldly ways that we can do practices that are good. The Buddha uh, recommended these kind of practices. But ultimately, you realize that none of that, that's just moving stuff around in your room. When you see the, the true emptiness, the mind that's come together by itself, not through your ego, not through your determination, then you realize, okay, I, I, now I know that the attainment of non-desire is possible. And then the meditation is really a case of seeing that, knowing that, cherishing that, and having confidence in that, uh, and so then you develop it bit by bit through through your lifetime. So, is the I raise the question: Is the path a sudden path or a gradual path? We read in suttas of people who suddenly become enlightened like that. Yeah, that's what I want. I want to. I want to go and. You know, sit with Ajahn Brahm and then that's it. <laughs> that would be a much easier way. Um, the Buddha said there was four paths. Do you know this one? There are four paths to enlightenment. I said there is the uh, short and easy path. This is the one that we all aspire to, the short and easy path. There is the long and easy path. There is the short but difficult path. And there is the long and difficult path. So most of us think we're on the long and difficult path, right? <laughs> Some people do have the short and easy path. Um, there's a famous teacher in Thailand called Dr. Sanong. You can download his book for free on the internet. It's only a very short book. You can read it in an afternoon. And he was on the short and difficult path. He went to a temple. He ordained as a monk. And they said to him, watch your breathing. So he sat there and he, he watched it all night. And by the end of the night, he'd, I don't know if he's enlightened, but he'd had all these experiences and a binya and different things, you know, gone through all the jhanas. Uh, you can read his book, it's very, it's very interesting, but, you know, he was just so determined uh, to follow that simple instruction. For me, I'm on the long and easy path. That's my chosen path to enlightenment. Um, the long listed to enlightenment. I'm guaranteed now, I've walked around the mountain. <laughs> There's no way that I can fail. <laughs> so this is doing your work. The long path, long and easy path is doing your work. There are things that you need to do, things that you need to develop, and not as a way to suddenly get enlightenment. That's all ego. You know, the ego does that. I was reading this guy in Google the other day, and he says, he wants to use these brain scanners. And he says, wow, he said, right now I reckon I can get my mind clear about 10% of the time. And he said, but if I use this thing in a couple of years, wouldn't it be great if I can get to 60% clarity, uh, you know, 45% of the time? That's not, how it <laughs> that's not how it works. That's how Google works. That's not how, you can't Google enlightenment in your brain. Um, so the, the sudden enlightenment, this is the ego, this is the ego wanting to figure it out, right? Ego wants to work out what enlightenment is. And usually as lay people, you know, you do a bit of meditation, you think, oh, I had this insight, I had this feeling. If I went on retreat for 10 days, I'd have a hundred of these feelings. Or if I ordained as a monk for a year, I'd, that would be it. I'd be, you know, saving the world, I'd be Maitreya Buddha. And it doesn't work like that, it doesn't happen. You, that's the ego extrapolating one little experience, well I want to get more of those, bigger, harder, faster, and, it, and then people ordain as a monk thinking that that's what it's going to be about, and it's not. Being a monk is about eating bad food that you don't want to eat, going to long ceremonies that you don't want to go to. Um, and 
you know, a lot of difficulties in being a monk, but what it teaches you is patience. My abbot would have these temple meetings, all monks required to attend the meeting, and they would go on for like five, six hours. And I couldn't understand a word of Thai. And you're all dressed up in the ceremonial robes, there's no air conditioning, and you just like, you melt, you literally you melt into the ground. <laughs> and it made me really determined to learn Thai so I could find out what the heck they're talking about. And then I, did, then I learned Thai and I found out what they're talking about. I was like, I wish I hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> One time they would, I'm not kidding, they talk for a, a good hour about how much oil is in the donuts. So being a monk actually is not about doing all this wonderful meditation and, and uh, being a monk is really you learn patience, is the big thing that you learn. You know? A lot of people come and talk to you when you don't want to talk to people or they tell you things you don't want to be told a lot of the time. They give you a lot of their opinions and their views that they dump on you and you, you know, you're not really interested. you wearing robes that are difficult, you know. Sometimes I'd like to just be able to just put on ordinary clothes and take the sky train or something in Bangkok and not have people look, you know, all looking at me. And Thai kids, when they see me run, you know, coming down the street, they, they jump up and down and tug on their mother's skirt and say, Prat Farang, Prat Farang. And I'm like, just leave me alone. <laughs> If I was, when I was a kid, if I'd seen like a black vicar or something, I wouldn't jump up and down and yell black vicar. I'd just like, I'd leave him alone. These are the thoughts that go through my head. And uh, So you learn patience. That's really the, the big thing about becoming a monk, is you learn, you know, walking on arms round, barefoot. You know, the mind starts complaining, we should wear shoes, why don't we wear shoes? It's unhealthy, you can catch diseases from yat, rat urine and things like this and you start thinking about it but there's nothing you can do and eventually you just give up and you just walk and then suddenly the mind comes together you're like <sniffs> breath comes right into the body and you've got everything you need in the world and you oh that's where it is that's why we have these traditions so the ego will look for solutions whereas the um, you know, for the sudden enlightenment, because that's what we like. The gradual enlightenment uh, is just doing your work, it's just doing your bit. So you can't wear shoes on your arms round, you just do your arms round. You can't choose the food, people bring you bad food and things, you know, I, I, I don't like eating meat, I still don't like eating meat. People bring you chicken and you know, people bring white rice and chicken, that's the daily staple. White rice and chicken, white rice and pork in the temple. And I don't like pork or chicken, and I don't like white rice, so... <laughs> you know why I don't like white rice? Was when I was six years old, my brother told me it was boiled maggots. And I've never liked... <laughs> I've had a negative perception of rice since then. So you just do your work. Uh, okay, you must know this one. Snow White, you've done, you, you know Snow White, right? Okay, good, I've got one that you know about. Snow White, I, I'd like to do, we could do another, the third day, we could do Snow White. Snow White is a very, very sharp fairy tale. A few people were here yesterday when I was talking about fairy tales. If you know the Dharma and you know how to read them, fairy tales are fantastic Dharma tools. Uh, everything in a fairy tale has a specific meaning. Um, I won't talk about all of the Snow White tale, but uh, you surely remember the Seven Dwarves, right? Now, if you have only seen the film, you'll remember Sneezy, Dopey, what were the other ones? Grumpy, Sleepy, Doc. Uh, but the point of dwarves in stories were they were, had no names and no characters. Disney put that in, because Disney don't know what they're doing. I wrote them a letter, but... <laughs> uh, the dwarves are the ones that do the work, because the they always work underground, they're always miners, and this means they're working in the subconscious. 
So, so long as you do your work, so long as you keep paying your bills, so long as you keep on practicing these little elements of Dharma, subconsciously uh, the work is being done down in the minds, down where you can't see it. And this is the gradual path of patience. It doesn't seem like you're solving problems. It doesn't seem like you're figuring out Dharma or attaining to great states of mind. But what's actually happening is that work is going on underneath. And so many people, you know, come to Dharma talks and think, you know, if I go to an Ajahn Brahm talk, I'll get more enlightened than if I go to a somebody else talk. And, you know, you get mixed up. What is a good Dharma talk, you think? You know, people get mixed up on this. Really, Dharma talks are just there to come together in the name of Dharma. That's what's really happening. Now, whether you like the talk or not, that depends on if the speaker is either A, entertaining, or B, inspi inspirational. Right? So many people come away from a talk. You know, I can make people laugh. I can joke around a bit. And they oh, it was a really good talk. You're like, well, what did he talk about? And they're like... Well, he told this story about a hairdresser or, you know, of seven dwarves. You know, well, what did he actually say? And often the people can't remember. So don't get mixed up between a good, a good Dharma talk is not really, that's not the way we should be looking at Dharma talks. What's good is that we have come together, you and I, as a group in the name of Dharma. And we're putting in that little bit of effort, that little bit of intention that little bit of puja that is worshipping, that is acknowledging and cherishing the quality of enlightenment. Okay? That's what's really good. Whether my talk or somebody else's is inspiring or funny or entertaining is kind of beside the point. So we do our work. That's what the long listed for enlightenment means. This is what the, the long and easy path. This is my particular path is all about paying your dues, doing your work, and then allowing the results to come later by itself. You know, if you're trying to do it with the ego, you're never going to have a very good result. Have you tried being patient egotistically? You know, you can't really do it. All of the qualities, try having metta with your ego, you can't really do it. So doing your work then, and then uh, what you find is you get these blessings that come from the practice, not from having figured things out, but from simply having done the puja, have done the meditation, been to talks, you know, tried your best to be a good person. Then it starts to kind of pay dividends. Remember one time I was in a hospital, just to finish off with. One time I was in hospital, and I really, really don't like uh, hospitals. I don't like going to hospital and I don't like having an operation but I really love it after the operation and you're in the hospital bed that I really adore. Why? All you have to do is lie there feel sorry for yourself and people bring you food. <laughs> what? <laughs> What's not to like about that? <laughs> and another thing when people say, how are you, you can tell them the truth, right, in a hospital. Normally, you have to say, I'm fine, thanks, and really you're not. In hospital, you say, I ache, I hurt, I'm miserable, and give me some pills, you know. So I really like being in hospital, and so I was in hospital this one time when I had my wisdom teeth out. And once they're out, I'm good. Before, I'm terrified, and not much I can do about that. But afterwards, and I'm lying there, this is nice. You know, people are like, oh, do you want magazines? Do you want chocolates and things like that? I've just had my wisdom teeth out. Chocolates is not. <laughs> you know, some, some aloe vera soup or something that I can suck through a straw, maybe. But, um, and so I was, I was lying there, and, and people are worried that you feel bad. And of course, the mouth hurts. And, but yeah, I think it's nice, just lying there, nice and peaceful, in a nice calm environment. I can't sleep. People have terrible problems with insomnia. I love it. I love just being there in the quiet at night. There's nothing to do. Uh, it's cool and it's calm. And just to sidetrack, the nurses in the hospital 
have a difficult time removing dead bodies. Um, I can't think of a polite way to put it. Whenever someone dies, that upsets the other patients, understandably. So the nurses have a hard time getting the dead bodies out without upsetting people. So what they usually do is they draw a curtain around you, okay, and then they put the, the sheets up like this, leave your head there, they don't cover your head, and then they wheel you out, and you could be asleep or under anesthetic or anything, and then they you know, quietly get rid of you. So the nurses have a secret code to, in order to indicate to each other and to the doctors that the patient has died, right? So then you know what to do, it's like, oh, that one's dead, right? Let's just keep calm and move them out quietly. And the secret code is, you're lying on your back on the bed and they fold your arms like this across your chest, right? And if that's happened, then they know that you're dead. So I'm there in hospital and I'm like, well, this is wonderful. I'm just, you know, really nice and it's cool and everyone is leaving me alone. I know, I'm going to do a bit of meditation. <laughs> <laughs> this poor nurse comes in and she sees me and she goes, oh, oh. And then she virtually climbed the wall when she saw me. She said, he was only having his wisdom teeth done. <laughs> now I'm sitting there perfectly still and I suddenly realized she's talking about me and I went, what? <laughs> There's a nurse-shaped hole in the wall as she ran away, you know. <laughs> So they told me afterwards about the secret code, and that's how I know why. I didn't realize how I'd upset her so much, you know. So I think this is, this is my example. Doing your work is you've, you have that patience, and then when you're in these situations, when you're ill or when you're sick, when you're dying or when somebody else is dying or when someone else is ill or sick, when you're waiting for buses and trains and planes and when your plane has been cancelled and you've got another three hours to wait and all these kind of things, you suddenly find that you have this patience because you've developed it over the time. You've paid your dues not through solving the, the riddle of enlightenment, which as I said at the beginning is something that we can't solve that riddle. We can't do it, we can't create it, we can't make it happen. But we can pay our dues, we can just bit by bit, day after day, month after month, we do our puja, we go to the Dharma talk, we meet up with other people, spiritual people are on the path, we sit and do meditation, don't worry about whether it's good meditation or it's bad meditation, don't worry whether it's um, you know, this, kind, this style of meditation or that style of meditation. Uh, these are all, this is the ego trying to fix everything, trying to get that sudden enlightenment. You just do the meditation, you just do the puja, you just read the books. So long as every day you're doing something that is dedicated to uh, enlightenment, bit by bit you'll start to, f to get the qualities, so bit by bit you will start to feel long term the benefits that the Dhamma is always there ready for you to use. So I'm stopping there and um, so we have a little bit of time if anybody has any questions. Yeah. Thank you, Bhante. Uh, my question is, um, you gave s some tips during our initial meditation on how to combat sloth as well as thoughts. Yeah. Can you also give tips on how to handle pain during meditation? That's my first question. Secondly, is you talked about the long and easy route, but I think most of us want to hear the first one, which is the short <laughs> and easy route. Yeah, the short and easy one is the more, more popular, but the least common, I think. The question is the short and easy path. Really, those people who are, I've seen or have done that have done it in their previous lifetimes. And there's an Indian sage called Punjaji, which I know none of you have heard of now. But 
And I went to see him. I believe he's enlightened. Uh, he's not a Buddhist. He's just an enlightened person. But he did always have a Buddha image next to him. It's the only thing that he had was a Buddha image. Um, and he got enlightened and he said, oh, all these practices that people do, they're a waste of time. And he said in his previous lifetime, he'd been an abbot of a temple, of a Hindu temple. But to me, that says that he's paid his dues in a previous lifetime. So I think the short and hard, sharp path, really, you've done all your work and you're just ready for that final difficult battle. Uh, handling pain in the meditation uh, is another long topic. Um, really, patience is the big thing, to have patience with the body, to have patience. Um, and also compassion for your body, that some people think, well, I'm going to have to do two hours meditation and make my body do it. Maybe your body isn't suited to do that. Maybe you need to rest up or sit on a chair or, or do something different. As a rule of thumb in meditation, if pain arises during the meditation, but after meditation, if you get up and walk around and the pain disappears, then usually it's a dharma pain, not something to really worry about. If you do meditation, but when you get up and walk around, that pain is still there, then that's a real pain and you need to maybe change your posture or change your seat or something, okay? As a general rule. For dharma pains, when the dharma pains come up, um, really is being patient with it because you, you feel that pain and then you move on. You know, don't get too absorbed in the particular pain itself. Um, I had a Dharma pain in my back. It was the size of a golf ball. And it was just right there in my back. And as soon as I'd sit, I'd go, and then it just like was there the whole time. And I had it for a year, this thing, this knot of pain in my back. And then I was sitting there one day, I remember the room that I was sitting in, and I remember there was a polystyrene in the windows to save heat in the evening. So they blocked the windows up with polystyrene to keep the heat in the room. I was looking at that, and the, it wasn't doing anything special. And the pain, this knot of pain just went, psh, vanished. I was like, oh my God, and then it, it was back. But... Once you've seen it disappear, you, you've, see, you've got its name. You're like, ah, this, isn't, this really isn't permanent. And then bit by bit, it kind of, you know, vanished. And a month later, I got the exact same pain on the opposite side. <laughs> but again, I've seen the ending of it. And so I was able to let that go. So Dharma pains is one thing to work with, and that's different to real pains. If you have... Uh, arthritis or, uh, you know, um, something or other, something bad, then A, you may need to go to the hospital, you may need to uh, have an operation. Um, if it's a chronic condition and there's nothing much you can do about it, then really you just, you're going to have to learn patience with it. Yeah. Venerable Pandit, yeah, uh, your uh, allusion to patience has brought me great relief in the sense that you know it relieves a lot of anxiety to achieve uh, certain certain right, uh, progress in this life. Uh, what about is there a danger to being overpaid, being too patient, mm. and is if it just how do we guard against that? Every good quality has its shadow side. Um, so, you know, compassion has a, you know, can easily turn into not non-accepting or, you know, or fear. Uh, love has its, ne every good quality has a negative side. So, patience, the negative side of patience is just being blasé and not caring. So, patience should be a vigorous patience, should be a bright and alert patience. But if patience is dull or sleepy or woozy, then it's turned into the shadow side of patience. I honestly think, again, this kind of the question is kind of 
another kind of ego creeping in in terms of you want to fix things, you want to get it right and and actually the patience is going the opposite way of that, it's like you really don't need to fix so much, just keep doing your work, keep doing your thing, you know, uh, keep making your deposits, you don't need to be a millionaire overnight, you just put a little bit of money in the bank every week and then eventually you'll be a millionaire. 